Hello all, my name is Dr. Jeanette Nicewinter. I'm an assistant professor of art history at Northern Virginia Community College. And this is a short lecture about the early Italian Renaissance, specifically um, about 1400 until about 1500 we're going to focus on. And we're also going to focus primarily on the city-state of Florence. So we're going to focus on just a couple of um, primary ideas coming out of Florence during the early Italian Renaissance. First, I'd like to start with a sculpture, um, probably one of the most famous sculptures to come out of the early Italian Renaissance. And I just wanna focus on some of the formal aspects. So first we have a nude figure. Um, we have not seen nude figures in the history of art up until this point um, from about the Romans until we get until the Renaissance. And that's because of the rules of Christianity that um, we're talking about no nude figures. So this is one of the first nude figures that we have um, since antiquity. And antiquity refers to um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Secondly, um, this is a younger boy. Third, we have this nice weight shift that you can see in the figure. So all of his weight is on this back leg that is straight. And then this other leg is nice and relaxed. And that weight shift is something called contrapposto. And again, it's something that is coming from antiquity. It's something that's coming from um, specifically the ancient Greeks. So that nice weight shift, as opposed to what we would have um, during the Gothic period, during the medieval period, very stiff and straight um, figures because they weren't concerned with the naturalism that we have during the Renaissance. The other thing to notice is that this is a bronze sculpture. So we um, go from using more stone during the Middle Ages, and then we have more bronze use during the Renaissance. And we just see a nice naturalism with that figure, with his head tilted down, kind of turning off to the side, this very cherubic um, or angelic face that he has. And he is, like we said, just standing very naturally. So that all kind of is contrast to what we saw during the Middle Ages. And if you know anything about Florence during this time, you'll know that Florence identifies itself with the biblical figure of David. David being an Old Testament figure best known for slaying the giant Goliath. And you can see Goliath's head right down here. And notice that Goliath still has his helmet on. He's a full grown man with this big bushy beard and the sword that David is holding in his hand, that's actually Goliath's sword that he's taken from the giant after slaying him. And then you can see the stone that David used to slay the giant in his other hand. And David was a shepherd boy, according to the Bible story. So that's why we see him with this very typical kind of shepherd's hat from this time period. And he's not wearing any clothes. It would seem odd to kind of go into battle against a giant wearing clothes or being naked. Um, but he supposedly said, no, I don't want any armor. I believe that God is going to um, get me through this, so I don't need armor. I have my faith. So that's why he's shown here naked. Probably wasn't naked, but this was a chance for Donatello, who's our artist here. This was a chance for Donatello to really show his skill in showing the human body and this new interest in naturalism and in that human body that, like I said, is really one of these hallmarks of the Renaissance. So you can see on the left, the Gothic period and very stiff and straight, and there's really no interaction between the figures. There's no shifting of the weight. We can't really see the figures' bodies underneath that drapery, as opposed to the Renaissance on the right with David, where we do have this naturalism. So David, on this figure of David, we have many, many sculptures of the same subject matter. This sculpture of David is considered the first life-sized nude figure since antiquity. So he's very significant for that reason. I just wanna show you a couple of close-ups that really make this figure of David unusual. Like we said, he is shown as a younger boy. Um, so sometimes he's shown a little bit older when you think of like Michelangelo's or Bernini's David that we'll get to much later. But here he's shown as very young, this um, younger shepherd boy, and then like we said, he is curling um, his feet into Goliath's beard down here. So you can see up here, that toe really twirling Goliath's beard. And then you can see the wings from Goliath's helmet. 
I'm going all the way up David's leg. And then on Goliath's, um, the sides of Goliath's helmet, you have some mythological scenes having to do with um, the god Cupid. Of course, you have a laurel wreath down the bottom to denote David's victory. But you also have this image that um, has some sexuality to it, has some sensuality, has a little bit of eroticism to it that you really wouldn't expect to see in a church. And that's because this wasn't a sacred commission. This wasn't a commission by the church. This was a commission um, by the Medici family who is really ruling Florence at this time. So the city of Florence is technically an oligarchy. And this is the city of Florence. We're right up in here. Right? So the city of Florence is technically an oligarchy, but it's really um, controlled by the the Medici family, um, who you might have heard of. They're pretty significant in terms of both the ruling of Florence, but also the commissioning of art during this time period. And as you can see here, they're commissioning multiple statues of David because David and his story of being strong but mighty and being able to slay someone much bigger than him through faith alone, that, um, and kind of a lucky shot with the slingshot, that is symbolic of the city of Florence and their um, trials and their different battles with the city of Milan to the north and how they constantly um, are able to defeat this much larger city with much more resources, even though they're much smaller. So we can see uh, Verrocchio on your right here and Verrocchio um, is another artist of this time period. He's actually the teacher for Leonardo da Vinci, who we'll get to in another lecture. When you think of the city of Florence, you might think of the Duomo, and that's what we're seeing here. So this is the main church in the center of Florence, and this dome is really a symbol of Florence itself. So another symbol of Florence itself, along with the story of David. And the story of this dome really dates back to the 1200s. So they built this church, they wanted to build this huge dome, and then they realized they had no idea how to do it. So it just sat there uncovered for a hundred years for hundreds of years until Brunelleschi comes along. So Brunelleschi has to figure out how do I cover this largest interior space since the Pantheon, so High Roman Empire Pantheon. How do I cover this bigger space? How do I make sure that it's not going to fall down because that was pretty common during the Middle Ages, which came before the Renaissance, that, okay, we're gonna build this really tall cathedral and oops, it collapsed. So he also has the problem that he can't find enough lumber to create an interior support system to create this dome. So normally when you would create an arch or you would create a dome, you would have an interior support system and you would use wood scaffolding so that you can lay everything on top and then you let it set remove the wood and it should stay in place. Well, this thing is so big and it's so tall, he couldn't find enough lumber and enough strong lumber in order to make the scaffolding. So what he does is he figures out he needs to make this as light as possible. And he also needs to figure out a way to get his workers up there and a way um, for this thing to essentially support itself. So what he does is he makes it an oval shape. So you can see it's kind of an egg shape. And what you're seeing here is both the interior dome and the exterior dome. So this is actually a series of two domes, one on the inside, one on the outside. And those two domes are oval shaped, so more of um, a point at the top, so more of the weight is going down than out. Because with a dome, you always have weight coming down, but you also always have weight pushing out. And if there's nothing there to kind of push back, it's going to fall out. So you have these interior, this interior dome, um, and you can see these ribs is what we talk about. Um, you can see them on the exterior. So these ribs is really where the weight is going down and into that drum. And then you have intermittent ribs in between those much bigger ones. And then those are also held together with these um, concentric circles, these concentric supports that are going around, which is kind of like a barrel. If you think of those old timey barrels with the wood and then they have metal supports going like this around, it's exactly what these are as well to again, stop that thrust from coming outwards. 
what this what he also does is he puts the bricks in a herringbone pattern so he kind of um places them perpendicular to one another so that they again will hold their own shape so it pushes um, the weight against one another. It creates this tension so that you're um, not relying as much on those ribs. Those bricks are actually in tension as well and holding themselves together. What he also does is he has a cantilevered support system at the top so that he has um, scaffolding at the top so that his workers can get up there. So cantilevering coming this way, um, coming out so that his workers can keep coming up and building this dome. What this also means when um, travel restrictions are no longer a thing and you go to Florence is that you can climb these stairs. So you can see them inside of here. You can climb the stairs inside of the Duomo and go all the way to the top and go all the way up to here. So um, when you go there, you'll see people walking around the base of the lantern. You get this great view uh, all around the city of Florence. So this is one of the um, engineering marvels for our early Italian Renaissance. Um, like we said, this is the largest interior space, the largest dome that has been created since the Romans, so since antiquity. One of the other major commissions that Brunelleschi has throughout the city of Florence is our Foundling Hospital, or his Hospital of the Innocents. And this is a um, hospital for orphans in the city of Florence. And what he does here is he creates an entirely new architectural style. So if we were looking at art from the Gothic period, um, so the period preceding this, it would be very over the top. It would be all about light and color. And you can see here that that's not at all what early Italian Renaissance architecture is about. Instead of this focus on spirituality and color and light, the Renaissance is all about harmony and order and rationality. And it's all about this idea of humanism, right? So we, in the, in the Middle Ages, you had this focus on the afterlife. You had this focus on God. You had this focus on your um, saints. During the Renaissance, the focus shifts to, well, if God made people in his image, then I have individual human potential, then I'm able to achieve all of these great things. I'm important too. So we have a, more of a focus on the human, and we call this idea humanism. So we have more of a focus on a human, and this also comes from the Greeks. So because of that, we're also trying to find the order and the rationality that God has placed into the natural world. So we're studying anatomy, we're studying botany, we're studying mathematics. Um, so it's also, when we think of the Renaissance, it's this time period of um, study and of scholarship as well, right? A Renaissance man or a Renaissance person is someone who is very well-rounded, very, very knowledgeable. So we see um, his interest in rationality here. So he creates these square modules. So the height of the columns, the distance between the columns, and the distance between the columns and the walls are all the same. So it creates these nice square units, and then he puts those in this nice repeating pattern. So again, you have all of this rationality. Everything is um, in harmony with one another. Also, there's nothing here to obscure us, um, to obscure our vision, to obscure us understanding that rationality, right? The focus is on the architecture. The focus is on the distance and the harmony and the way that these parts are all coming together. So when you think of the early Italian Renaissance, we'll think of kind of Brunelleschi's scheme here, very austere, very rational, um, very orderly. The other kind of orderly aspect that we have happening during the early Italian Renaissance is this idea of scientific or linear perspective. So we use those two terms interchangeably. So this is one of the first paintings, um, and this is a fresco painting inside of a church, so on the wall of a church. And you can see that what Masaccio is doing is he's trying to create the illusion of depth in a two-dimensional surface. So until this point, Again, we weren't really concerned with naturalism. We weren't concerned with creating illusionism. But during the Renaissance, we're concerned with understanding how space works, how the illusion of space works. So we get this sense of depth in this Masaccio painting by using something called orthogonals. 
that go towards a vanishing point. So that what Masaccio very cleverly does is that he takes these coffers, so these are the squares in the ceiling, and the lines from those coffers all come towards the central point, all lead your eye down to the central point called the vanishing point. So um, think of like a train track, right? Going all the way to a, a point on the horizon, that's the vanishing point. So our eye see the, sees those lines as converging as they recede away from us, and those are called orthogonals. That's how we kind of trick the eye into understanding this space. The other thing that Masaccio does here, um, so we have the Virgin Mary over here, John the Evangelist on the other, or John the Apostle on the other side. These are the donors. And you can see that the donors are closer to us. Therefore, they're a little bit larger than the figures that are away from us. So again, things that are closer are going to be larger, more distinct than things that are further away from us, going to be blurrier and less distinct. And we can see that with the donor portraits. We can also see that with our um, kind of tomb in the front. So this is called a memento mori. You can see the skeleton at the bottom. And memento mori is a reminder of death. So it's just saying, um, I was once what you are, what I am, you will be. And it says that right here. And this is our reminder that we, um, even though we're in the Renaissance and we have this new focus on learning and this life and being um, human and having lots of potential, also you have to remember that you're going to die. And when you die, you're going to have to do something with your sins. So if you did not live a good life, you might be um, kind of SOL. You might not be going to heaven. So it's just a little reminder down the bottom there that this is um, still a focus of our art. It's still a focus of culture at this time. So the other um, kind of innovation that we have during the early Italian Renaissance is portraiture. And portraiture was not, um, not common until this period because again, it wasn't about us. It wasn't about us as people. It was about God and the saints and repenting. But here you can see um, this portrait of Federico de Montefeltro, and he is in Urbino, he's the Duke, and then Battista Sforza, um, and she was his wife. Um, they married when she was 14. She dies about 26 in childbirth, and this was possibly painted right after she died from childbirth. So that's um, also why she has like a little very pale skin. Um, she's a little more kind of hooded in the eyes, possibly to reference that death. But I want you to notice that one, they're set against this beautiful landscape. So they're not set in an architectural scene. Um, and this is something that carries through the Italian Renaissance. But two, that these are really depictions of people, right? They're actual portraits. This is probably how they looked. Are they a little photoshopped? Probably. But so much so, um, he has his kind of jutting out chin. He has this really unattractive nose, or nowadays it would be very unattractive, right? So he has all of these characteristics that are really unique to him. Same thing with her, this very straight kind of aquiline nose, this recessed chin. So this is a portrait. This is actually how somebody would look. And this is coming down from the north to the south. Um, so there's a Northern European Renaissance happening at the same time in the 1400s. And this is one option, one um, influence that comes down from the north to the south. Um, in the north though, they have more of like a three quarter view, which is more like that. You'll notice here we have just that profile view. And the profile view was preferred in Italy because that's how people were shown on Roman coins. So again, the Renaissance being this rebirth of classical art and culture, so ancient Greece and Rome, and then that focus on Rome, especially in Italy. Lastly, I want to talk to you about Botticelli, um, so possibly the most famous painting that we are talking about today. Again, probably commissioned by the de' Medici. Um, and at this point, we are at Lorenzo the Magnificent, who was just this it was just a force of a person, right? So um, we kind of go the opposite way with Botticelli. So before we're talking about naturalism and looking at the body, looking at space, looking at how do I show this three-dimensional world in two dimensions. But when you look at Botticelli's work, it's very flat. 
you can see the seashell isn't giving us this convincing illusionism that we would expect from the Renaissance. It doesn't really sink into the water in a convincing way. The water is very flat as it recedes back, and these waves become almost patterns. They're not necessarily an illusionistic wave. They're more these patterns of the waves as they recede towards that horizon. So Botticelli um, kind of sneaks under the radar. He kind of gets away from what everybody is so interested in, in terms of the scientific um, interest in art during this time. But he's really important because he's working with ideas that aren't Christian. So we looked at David, we looked at a church, we looked at, um, you know, Masaccio, all of these are still Christian subjects. But one thing that we have during the Renaissance is we also have this rebirth of subjects that are not Christian. So this rebirth of the Greek and the Roman gods um, within art as well. But this also might have been related to um, kind of courtly love poems. It might have been related to kind of a really um, focusing on the adoration of the body, the adoration of love, and then not necessarily, um, again, as much Christianity. He does really love the body, as you can see here. Um, he obviously knows the body, but he elongates it. He really uh, makes it very sensual in terms of Venus, and Venus is being born out of the ocean, is how the story goes, and she is being, be being pushed towards land over here by Zephyr, who is holding on to Chloris. And then you have Venus's attendant over on the side. Um, so Venus being the goddess of love and beauty, and she's about to kind of swath Venus in this big, beautiful cloak. You can see that this thing is huge. So this painting is gigantic. It's almost six foot by nine feet. And it was this really big kind of immersive artwork. And Botticelli is really working for the court. Um, so a lot of the works that we're seeing are being commissioned by individuals, um, individual nobles, individual courts, individual guild systems. Um, so a guild is a group of skilled um, workers that group together. So you have like the Goldsmiths Guild, the Painters Guild, the Masons Guild. They would get together and commission art as well. And all of this focus on things that aren't Christian, things that aren't necessarily directly tied to God and the church and um, living a holy life comes to a head with this guy called Savonarola. So the 1400s is this huge fluorescence in Florence of art and learning and humanism. And then Lorenzo the Magnificent dies. So Lorenzo de' Medici dies. And this guy Savonarola comes into power. Savonarola is um, technically a prior, he's technically a man of the cloth, and he's in power from about 1494 until 1498, but in those four years he preaches doom and gloom, and essentially that all of these frivolous undertakings that the de' Medici have been um, commissioning throughout this time are going to be Florence's downfall, and he has um, what you can see here. He has this bonfire of the vanities. So any of these artworks, any of this, um, any of these books, any of this scholarship, anything that doesn't have to do with the church, he wants literally thrown into a bonfire. And this does happen. And Botticelli, um, his self-portrait right here, Botticelli participates. So we've lost a lot of Botticelli's as well um, that might have still been in his possession. And we see the shift in Botticelli too here from these kind of light, airy, beautiful subjects to very dark um, Christian subjects after this time. So even though Savonarola is only in power for about four years, he causes this end, this kind of stark um, contrast between this early Italian Renaissance in Florence and then after he is in power, we shift the Renaissance down to Rome. So you have artists no longer being commissioned in the north. We're now moving down to about central Italy. Savonarola doesn't last long. Like we said, 1498 um, is when he dies. And he dies, he is um, burned at the stake for heresy. So 
He um, has his lasting impact though. He had exiled the de' Medici and then they're allowed back into the city in 1521, but by then it's too late um, and things are already happening in Rome and Milan that Florence can't really catch up any longer. So thank you so much for your time today. <laughs>